listen to this tale of King Arthur. Now every Christmas time, King Arthur kept his Christmas court at Camelot, and all the knights of the table round were gathered there, Sir Lancelot, Sir Kay, Sir Gawain, Sir Bedivere, and Queen Guinevere, and all the ladies as well. And oh, what merrymaking there was. It lasted until well after New Year's. There was the great Yule log, and the musicians played, and what food there was. But at every banquet, King Arthur said, we will have no feasting until someone brings us tale of wonder or adventure. Now, no sooner had those words come out of Arthur's mouth one day, when into the great feasting hall, there suddenly came a horse and rider. The horse was huge. The man upon his back was a giant as well. And both were green, completely green. The man was dressed in green. His hair was green. His beard was green. His face was green. But his eyes were red. And in one hand he held a holly branch. And in the other hand he held a huge axe. And as he clattered into the feasting hall he called out, what ho, knights of the table round, I issue to you a challenge. Any man here, is there one brave enough to cut off my head? And in a year's time, he will allow me to behead him. There was dead silence. At last, Arthur stepped down from his throne and walked up to the green giant and said, you wish to fight with one of my knights? Nay, said the giant, they are mere puny boys. No, the challenge that I issue is for one of them to behead me. Still, there was dead silence. At last, King Arthur said to the green giant, All right, I will behead you. And just then, Sir Gawain, the nephew of King Arthur, stepped forth and said, Uncle, it is not right. You are the king. I will take this challenge upon me. And he stood before the green knight and said, I accept your challenge. And the green knight said, You understand. You are to take my axe and cut off my head. And in a year's time, I will behead you. I understand, Sir Gawain said, and he took the great heavy axe, and the huge green giant knelt before him and flipped his green hair over his head so that his neck was bare. <coughs> and Sir Gawain raised high the axe and brought it down and cut off the giant's head. And great amounts of blood spurted out on the stone floor. But the giant still lived. He stood up and he picked up his own severed head by his green hair. And the head spoke. Well done, Sir Gawain. I will see you in a year's time. Next New Year's Day, meet me at the Green Chapel. And he climbed back on his horse and rode out of the feasting hall. It was several minutes before anyone felt like feasting, but they resumed their Christmas festivities and Christmas time was over, and it was winter, and then green spring, and then golden summer, and ripe fall, and it was time for Sir Gawain to accept the challenge of the Green Knight. He put on his armor, 
and he mounted his good horse, Gringolet, and he said goodbye to his uncle, Arthur the king. And he rode off in search of the green chapel. It was cold winter, and he asked every person that he met if they had heard of the green chapel, but no one had. He slept at night in his armor on the cold, hard ground, and he was hungry and sore. At last, he rode out of the forest, and there before him was a beautiful castle. He rode up to the drawbridge, and the porter of the castle called out, Gentle knight, you are welcome here. And the drawbridge was lowered, and Sir Gawain rode into the courtyard of the castle. And there stepped forward the lord of the castle, a great burly man he was, and he said, Good night, you are welcome here. We are celebrating the Christmas Come to our feast. And the servants of the lord of the castle took Sir Gawain to a comfortable chamber and gave him a warm bath and fine clothes of fur and velvet. And Sir Gawain came down to the Christmas feast. The lord of the manor said, I would like you to meet my wife. And the lady of the castle stepped forward. She was the most beautiful lady Sir Gawain had ever seen, more beautiful even than Queen Guinevere. And they sat and enjoyed the Christmas feast. And then Sir Gawain asked them all, Have any of you heard of the Green Chapel? Of course, said the lord of the castle. It is but two miles from here. I must go there on New Year's Day and meet a challenge, Sir Gawain said. Well, the Lord said, you can stay here and rest. And on New Year's Day itself, it is but a short ride from here. I will make you a, a wager. You stay here, spend Christmas with us, and then while you are resting, I will go out hunting. And whatever animals I kill, I will give to you, but you must give to me whatever you earn in the castle while I am away. Agreed? Agreed, said Sir Gawain. So after the Christmas festivities, very early in the morning, the lord of the castle rode out hunting with his horses and hounds, and Sir Gawain stayed in bed. And the lord of the castle hunted the deer, the stag, and the doe. And Sir Gawain stayed in bed. And at about the middle of the morning, he was aware that someone was in his room. He opened his eyes, and there was the beautiful lady of the castle. Good morning, Sir Gawain, she said. My husband told me to give you whatever you want. I wish only to talk with you, Sir Gawain said. And the lovely lady sat on his bed, <laughs> and they laughed and talked all the morning long. And at noon, the lady gave him a kiss and left. He put on his clothes and spent the rest of the day in the chapel, and that night at the feasting, the lord of the castle came back, and he had killed many deer. This is what I killed today, he said to Sir Gawain. What did you get? Sir Gawain walked up to the lord of the castle and kissed him on the cheek. The next morning, very early, the lord got up and went out hunting with his hounds and horses, and Sir Gawain stayed in bed. The lord went hunting the fierce wild boar, and Sir Gawain stayed in bed. And in the middle of the morning, he was aware that there was someone in his room. He opened his eyes, and there again was the beautiful lady. Good morning to you, sir. What would you like today? 
only to talk with you, said Sir Gawain, for you are the wife of the lord of the castle. So they chatted and told stories and sang songs half the day, and as the lady stood up to go, she gave Sir Gawain two kisses. And that night at the feasting, the lord of the castle came in carrying a huge head of a wild boar with great yellow tusks. Here, he said to Sir Gawain, this is what I got today. What did you get? And Sir Gawain kissed the lord of the castle on each cheek. Now the next morning, the lord got up early and went out hunting, and this day he was hunting the fox. And Sir Gawain stayed in bed. And after several hours, he opened his eyes, and there again was the beautiful lady. Sir Gawain, I would like to give you a present. What is it? he said. And she took from around her slender waist a green sash. This is for you. It will protect you from all harm. And Sir Gawain remembered that he was to be beheaded by the Green Knight. And he said, Lady, I accept your gift gladly. And the lady gave him three kisses. And that night, the lord of the castle <laughs> came into the feasting and he said, Today, I only killed this skinny fox. What did you get? Sir Gawain gave the Lord three kisses, but he never mentioned the green belt. The next day was New Year's Day. <laughs> Sir Gawain did not sleep late that morning. He was up very, very early, and he put on his armor and mounted his good horse Gringolet, and a servant from the castle led him to the green chapel. It was nothing but a cave in the hills. Good luck to you, said the servant, and Sir Gawain was alone. From within the cave, he heard the sound of the ax being sharpened. And then there before him was the green knight with his head once again upon his neck. I see you are here to meet the challenge, said the Green Knight. Indeed I am, said Sir Gawain, and he took off his helmet, and he knelt before the Green Knight. The Green Knight raised the axe, but as he brought it down, at the last moment, Sir Gawain flinched back. Ha! You have not the courage. I did not flinch when you beheaded me, said the Green Knight. It will not happen again, said Sir Gawain. And a second time, the Green Knight raised up his axe. He brought it down, but at the last moment, he drew it aside. I see your courage has returned. Hurry up, said Sir Gawain. I can't wait forever. A third time, the Green Knight raised the axe and brought it down swiftly, but he only nicked Sir Gawain's neck, and there was but a tiny trickle of blood on the white snow. Swiftly, Sir Gawain stood up and put on his helmet and raised his sword. You had your chance to cut off my head, and now I will fight you. No, said the Green Knight. You accepted my challenge, and you were brave enough to let me try to behead you. Don't you know who I am? I am the lord of the castle where you were just staying. I was your host, and I set my wife to tempt you, and each day you prove to be a pure and noble knight. And that is why the first two times I did not cut off your head. And the third time, I knew you had accepted a gift from her, 
the green sash, but you didn't tell me about it. But because it was only to save your life, I only nicked your neck. This sash belongs to you, said Sir Garwin, untying it. Here, my lord, do take it back. No, said the Green Knight. Keep it always as a token of this adventure. And Sir Gawain rode back to Camelot and told King Arthur and all the knights of the table round of his adventure. And when they saw he was wearing a green sash, every one of the knights of the table round also wore a green sash to remember the adventure of Sir Gawain and the green night. And we'll be back in a few minutes with another story. Hi, I'm Art Paul Gosler. As a teenager, I've seen what drugs do to other kids. Not everyone takes it seriously, and that's why it's important for kids to participate in D.A.R.E., the drug abuse resistance education program that's taught in schools across the country. D.A.R.E. teaches kids how to say no to drugs, resist peer pressure, and build self-esteem. To find out how to start a D.A.R.E. program in your school, call 1-800-TALK-KFC-DARE. Drugs are no laughing matter. This next story comes from Russia. And I thought it would be nice to use these little nesting dolls which are called Matrushka, to help tell this story. It's always very cold during the Russian winter, and who brings all the wind and snow and ice? Old Grandfather Frost. From the Northland he blows, and winter comes. But sometimes Grandfather Frost smiles on people. Once there was a little village, and in that village there lived a woodcutter named Paval, and his wife was named Katarina. They were very prosperous. They had plenty to eat. They had a nice warm house, and they had clothes to keep them warm in the winter. But there was one thing that Paval and Katarina did not have, and that was any children. And in their village, they would look at all the children playing and laughing throughout the year, and they would sigh and wish that they had a child of their very own. One day, just as the winter was beginning to come, Pavel was in the forest cutting wood. And very softly, the first snowflakes began to fall down. Ah, Grandfather Frost is sending the snow early this year. Well, they say, first snow, magic snow. Well, there's no one around to see what I'm doing. Why not? So Pavel scooped up some of the snow, and he, <coughs> he made a little snowball, and, and then he scooped up more snow, and he made another snowball, and he took the first snowball and stuck it onto the second <coughs> one, and... And then he took some red berries and put a little mouth on the snowball and, and some stones and made a nose and some bigger stones that made nice black eyes. And Well, there was no one there to see him, so he held the little snow baby cradled in his arms and rocked it back and forth. Suddenly, the baby kicked him. He looked down, and the snow baby had become real. <gasps> and she was smiling up at him and giggling. Oh, he couldn't wait to run home. And, and Katerina said, what do you have there, a sack of potatoes? A new kitten? No, said Paval. And he showed Katerina the little snow baby that had become real. Well, it snowed and it snowed. For seven whole days it snowed and while it was snowing. That little snow baby was growing. First, she was just a tiny little baby giggling. And then next, very quickly, 
She learned how to walk and talk and was a little toddler. And before the week was out, she was a little girl, about five years old. <laughs> they called her Snegorka, which means little snowflake. And she chanted a little song. First snow, magic snow, deep inside the drifts I grow. Ruby red, snowy white, growing in the winter's night. Snowflakes fall, snowflakes fly, little pieces of the sky. Catch them quick, catch them fast, or they'll melt. They just won't last. Well, after seven days, it stopped snowing, and all of the children in the village ran outside to play in the wonderful snow. Now, there was a boy, and his name was Vanya, and he had a wonderful sled, and he also had a great white dog named Misha. Vanya would hitch Misha up to his sled, and it would be pulled up to the top of the highest hill, and then he would <coughs> unhitch Misha, and he would slide down the hill and over the snow that covered the frozen ice of the lake. Vanya did that again and again, and then he noticed a little girl that he'd never seen before. Would you like to come sledding with me, said Vanya. Yes, said Snegorka. So together they went up to the hill and they slid down again and again. They did that every single day, all throughout December and January and February and part of March. But suddenly in March, Snegorka heard a sound she'd never heard before. Drip, drip, drip. What's that, she said to her mother. Oh, that's the snow melting. Is all the snow going to go away, said Snegorica. Well, eventually, said her mother. Crack, came a sound. What's that, said Snegorica. Oh, that's just the ice breaking up on the lake, said her mother. And then Vanya came and said, I think this is the last day we can go sledding. So they went out, and there was a lot of mud and just a little bit of snow. And Misha pulled the sled up to the top of the hill, and they slid down the hill for the last time. But as they slid over the ice on the lake, suddenly, crack, the ice broke, and they fell into the dark black water. Help, said Vanya, I can't swim. Snigorka grabbed a hold of his muffler, and Misha grabbed a hold of her coat and pulled the two of them out of the water. And they went to the house of Anastasia, the oldest woman in the village, and she gave Vanya some special tea to make him feel better. She looked long and hard at Snegorka and said, I think Vanya has a special guardian angel. Well, then there was no more snow or ice left at all. And the village had a special ceremony that they did every time at that point in the year. They took their mattresses, and they cut their mattresses open, and they took out all the old winter straw. And they put all the old winter straw in a big pile in the center of the village square, and they set it on fire. And one by one, the children ran up to the bonfire and jumped over the fire, jumping out of winter into spring. And Vanya said to Snegorka, come on, he took her by the hand, and they ran towards the bonfire. But when Vanya jumped, he was all by himself, and there was nothing but a cloud of steam next to him. And then that disappeared as well. Where's Snegorka? said her parents. Where could she have gone? They searched everywhere and they couldn't find her. At last they went to the house of old Anastasia, and she said, don't you know who Snegorka was? She was a child of Grandfather Frost. She was a child of the first magic snow. She has gone back north, back to live with Grandfather Frost. We will find her, said her parents. We will search everywhere. So they asked their neighbors to take care of their house and their pets and their orchard trees, and they set out to the north. And they walked 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 and they walked, and they walked until they came to the land of the Finnish people. 
the Sami, and an old Sami woman had them inside her tent, and they said to her, Do you know where Grandfather Frost lives? And she said, He lives in a place that is closed, yet open, quiet, yet filled with sound, cold, yet warm. Thank you, said Pavel and Katerina, and they headed north again. And they walked 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 until they came to a forest of pine trees. And they came to a, an enclosure, a circle in the middle. And Katerina said, I think this is the place. Look, it is open to the sky. It's closed with trees. It's very quiet, but I hear music. It's cold here, but my heart is warm. And suddenly, walking towards them, they saw Grandfather Frost. And with him was none other than little Snegorka. And she said, Mother, Father, you came to search for me. No, said Grandfather Frost. You must stay here with me. Please, said Pavel and Katerina. We love her so very much. Go to sleep, said Grandfather Frost. In the morning I will give you my answer. And they fell asleep when the pine needles fell on the snow and made them a bed. But the next morning, when they woke up, they were back in their own beds, in their own house, in their own village. And when they looked out, the snow was falling again. And who did they see running towards them but little Snegorka? First snow, magic snow. With the snowflakes, home I go. Snowflakes fall, snowflakes fly. Little fingers of the sky. All my parents searched for me, and I am here to be with you each winter. And so Snegorka stayed with her parents each winter. And Grandfather Frost let her stay with them each year. And now he brings the winter to you.